اور یہاں آپ کو بتائیں گے کہ وزیر آزم عمران خان نے وی آر ٹی نیوز بیلجیم کو انٹرویو میں کہا ہے کہ افغان امن عمل کے لیے پہلی دفعہ درست راستے کا انتخاب کیا گیا امریکہ طالبان مذاکرات کی کامیابی سے ہی افغانستان میں پائیدار امن کا قیام ممکن ہوگا دہشت گردی کے خلاف جنگ میں ستر ہزار پاکستانیوں نے جان کی قربانی دی تاہم نائن الیون کے بعد دو ہزار انیس پاکستان میں محفوظ ترین سال رہا دو ہزار بیس معیشت کی بحالی کا سال ہوگا وزیراعظم نے کہا کہ بھارتی قیادت انتہا پسند سوچ اور آر ایس ایس کے فاشسٹ نظریہ پر عمل پیرا ہے وزیراعظم عمران خان کا وی آر ٹی نیوز سے یہ انٹرویو آپ سے شیئر کرتے ہیں آپ بھی بلاسہ کیجئے Dat zegt premier Imran Ghan in een exclusief interview met onze verslaggever Steven de Kranen. So, um, prime minister, may I ask first, um, how different is it to leading a country than to captain uh, a sports team? Because leadership is needed in both. Uh, well, let me first say the similarity. Similarity in both is that you have to struggle. And the dynamics of struggle are such that you only succeed if you learn from the bad times, from your mistakes. You learn and then you uh, pick yourself up. So that's where the similarity is. Otherwise, it's, of course, completely different. Uh, running a cricket team is completely different to running a country. Uh, and, of course, different challenges. Um, and then countries with entrenched, strong institutions are much easier to run. A country which, uh, which uh, 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 faces challenges in uh, the worst challenge in our, uh, as far as the economy is concerned, uh, huge fiscal and uh, current account deficits. And so in that, uh, obviously, it's a much bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. If we start with uh, the hardest issues, um, Kashmir, we in Europe are wondering Will it ever be a happy place, Kashmir? Is there a solution possible? Uh, Kashmir is uh, something which Pakistan and India have actually gone to war three times. And Kashmir remains the, own, the biggest hurdle in there being normal relationship between these the two big South Asian countries. And actually, Kashmir is the main hurdle Uh, which would uh, lead to, uh, which is in the way of trade prosperity. Because, uh, you know, if, if the two countries were trading with normal relationship, then the best way to reduce poverty in the subcontinent would be uh, trade and normal relations. So Kashmir has a <coughs> problem that ha has been very difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, sort out because Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, India it feels it's a stronger power, might is right, whereas the UN resolutions in way 70 years ago, uh, according to them, the people of Kashmir had the right for self-determination. They were supposed to, through a plebiscite, decide their destiny. They wanted to go to India or Pakistan. That right was never given, uh, because India knew that if that right was given, they would opt for Pakistan because it's a Muslim majority province. And India was divided uh, according to the majority religion. So if it was a, a Hindu majority, it went to India. Or if it was Sikh majority, it went to India. If it was Muslim majority, it became Pakistan. Kashmir was an overwhelming Muslim majority province. And through force of arms, India has occupied it. And they, they promised but did not allow them to have the right for self-determination. This promise was made by the first Prime Minister, Mr. Nehru, but that promise was never fulfilled. So Kashmir now has become a, a real problem because what India has a problem for India, because they have forcibly annexed it. It was a dispute between Pakistan and India. They have annexed it unilaterally. And for over six months, the people of Kashmir are in an open prison by 700,000 Indian troops. Eight million people of Kashmir have no access to media. Their leaders have been uh, put in jail. They're, anyone who protests has been uh, put into jail, students, teenagers. 
media clamped down. So there's a siege. Eight million people are under siege by 700,000 troops. And do you think, apart from Kashmir, will there ever be normal relations between Pakistan and India, or is it too much history or too soon, perhaps? No, I, I, I feel that uh, if there was strong, clear-headed leadership in India, this problem would be solved. It, no problem. Every problem has a solution. Problem in India right now is that they have an extremist ideology. The RSS is an extremist ideology, inspired by the Nazis in the 30s. Uh, and the founding fathers of RSS, which is ruling India now, were inspired by Hitler. And this racist uh, Aryan philosophy of Hitler, and, uh, and they backed the, uh, the uh, Holocaust of the Jews because they believe in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from India. So it is an extreme ideology, and unfortunately it has taken over uh, India. And that's why they have they put these 8 million Kashmiris who are Muslims, mm -hmm. they put them in an open prison. So I do not see much hope uh, with this government, but I do see that in future uh, an Indian government, a strong leadership, they would want this issue to be resolved. And as I said, every problem has a solution. Talk about uh, solutions. <clears throat> In Afghanistan, there are talks between U.S. and Afghan Taliban. Um, what is Pakistan doing to make it, it a success? Well, uh, first of all, you must r remember that uh, in Pakistan, there are still 2.7 million Afghan refugees here. And there are uh, refugee camps which have uh, over 100,000 people still living here. So um, what Pakistan can do is uh, put leverage on the Afghans, on the Taliban, some of whom have families here, uh, to, to make peace in Afghanistan. And I can assure you that Pakistan has tried its best. I, since my government has come in, we have left no stone unto unturned uh, so that there would be peace in Afghanistan. And uh, fortunately, things are moving in the right direction. It's not going to be easy because there's been 19 years of conflict. But it is for the first time moving in the right direction. The Americans are uh, 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 wanting peace and dialogue with Taliban, and Taliban have now sitting with the Americans. The next phase would be ceasefire, then possibly an agreement, if the ceasefire goes well then an agreement, and then I guess the next phase would be the Taliban set up with the Afghan government. Mm -hmm. And what about Pakistan? If you move to Pakistan, are the dark times <coughs> over because there were some very hard years also for Pakistani people with uh, terror-related incidents, um, bombings, shootings? Do you think that extremism is stamped out? You see, l let me just explain what happened in Pakistan so that you need to know the history. In the 1980s, Pakistan uh, was backing the Mujahideen, who were backed by the Americans and CIA and the Western countries, to fight against Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So it was called the Afghan Jihad. So Pakistan backed the Afghan Jihad. A lot of the Mujahideen came from different countries to fight in Afghanistan. And this was all, of course, encouraged by Western countries. and. Uh, uh, and of course uh, backed by the Americans and a lot of these groups were trained in Pakistan. So once the, when the Soviets left Afghanistan uh, in 1989, Pakistan and Afghanistan were left with these uh, militant groups, these guerrillas, these uh, uh, different Mujahideen groups. And so come 9-11, now the United States lands in Afghanistan. Now the same groups who were told that jihad was a good thing against foreign invaders, because the United States came, they now are told that no against the United States because these are the good guys, it's terrorism. It was jihad against the Soviets. So of course, not all of them understood and Pakistan, by joining the US war, we ended up these groups turning against Pakistan. 
So that's when we went again, this period of uh, terrorism, suicide attacks. 70,000 Pakistanis lost their lives in, in that 10, 12 year period. Uh, and fortunately, and full marks to our security forces, and especially our intelligence agencies, who gave great sacrifices, but they now have controlled the insurgency. And, and I was, I'm very happy to say that my first year as Prime Minister, 2019 was the safest year in Pakistan since 9-11. Okay. If we move to, to another hard issue, you, you've spoken about the economy, uh, double-digit inflation, huge debt, uh, loan with IMF. People would say, how can you succeed? But in the street, people tell to me, the Prime Minister is very resolved because he, prove, he has proven it in cricket, he has proven it with the hospital, he has proven it be becoming prime minister, but what can you do to be different than your <coughs> predecessors to really make it work? Well, it's like if your house, is, if you inherit a house which is bankrupt and their creditors coming to ask for their money back and their loans and the, someone is coming for rent of the house, others are coming for the rent, you've rented a car or something. So for a while that house goes through a tough period while you cut your expenses and you raise your revenues so you you no longer are indebted and so you don't have to borrow and then you have to pay the uh, the interest on the loans so that is a tough period every house which borrows uh, and where the expenses are more than its uh, revenues every house goes through a tough period and every country which has been in the same situation as pakistan has to go through what is called the structural readjustment where you raise your revenues to match your expenditure. And while you cut your expenditure, obviously, you know, the people go through a bad time. Uh, not only did we have this big fiscal deficit and current account deficit, uh, we also have uh, bankrupted utilities. Our electricity, uh, uh, you know, had incurred huge losses. So we had a huge debt in electricity and then our gas, so that affected our industry because the cost of, because of these huge debts, you had to raise the uh, prices of electricity and gas. Uh, and when you raise the prices, the industry got affected because that can't compete with the exports of your neighboring countries, which means you can't reduce your deficit. So you're caught in this debt trap. Um, and so uh, the first year was very difficult. 2019 was a very difficult year for Pakistan. But now, fortunately, we brought the current account deficit down by 75% in one year, which, is, which, is, uh, which was tough, but good. Uh, we, I, I, exports are increasing, not that fast, because the world at the moment, the uh, oh, economy in the, overall in the world is slowing down. But we've cut down our imports. We've tried to um, uh, work on our electricity sector so that you know, we cut down the losses. So you know, it's been a tough period of readjustment. And I expect that you know, this is the year, 2020, where we will, the economy will show signs of recovery. Yeah, because um, you've spoken about priority, lifting 100 million Pakistani out of poverty, uh, new Pakistan. What is your vision for an ideal deal Pakistan, which kind of country would you say Pakistan should be? Uh, new, my idea of Pakistan is what was the founding father's idea of Pakistan, which was an Islamic welfare state, a state which is just and humane, which, uh, which uh, uh, looks after the state, looks after the bottom tier of the population, the weaker section of the society. And in, you know, if you ask me, the, well, the first Islamic state was the first welfare state in the history of mankind some uh, 14 centuries ago. State of Medina? Or state yeah. of Medina. Yeah. It was a welfare state. And it was a state which had rule of law. It had rights. Every human being had rights protected by the state. And that was the basis of the civilized state which became, which, which laid the foundation for the next seven centuries, it became the leading civilization in the world. And of course, emphasis on education, which was laid by our prophet, peace be upon him. So therefore, that's my ideal. 
And uh, if you ask me in modern day which state would would resemble that, I would say Scandinavian states, because they are very they have very high welfare. I find them very civilized. And what China has achieved, China has taken out, uh, taken out 700 million people out of poverty in the last 30 years. But different political systems, uh, welfare state, tax collection is needed then? Uh, uh, look, first of all, you need to have direction. Uh, you know, the leadership in a country needs to know where it is headed, what it wants to achieve. So if your objective is that my main, I will achieve prosperity by raising people uh, above the poverty line, which is what China did. Because China 30 years ago was not that rich an economy. But by lifting people out of poverty, they created extra demand. And then the extra demand meant the, the entire world's multinationals wanted to be there. And, and China has, uh, you know, it's remarkable, it's a miracle. But the basis, the basis of that prosperity was that the state took a decision that our priority is to lift people out of poverty. That's what my uh, decision is. Despite all the problems uh, what we face, we have allocated the highest amount of money for poverty alleviation in our history. I mean, despite the economic crunch, we had the outlay for uh, uh, poverty alleviation is the highest today in Pakistan. And um, <clears throat> when you're talking about moving economically, there is cooperation with China. What is the message uh, from Pakistan to Europe? What do you expect from Europe or what do you want to ask from, from Europe? Well, um, trade really, you, Europe has been very good to us. We have got the GSP plus, which means, we, you know, we get uh, preferential trade uh, agreement with Europe. And that's very positive. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, Europe is, a, is one of Pakistan's biggest trading partner. So trade really with Europe. Pakistan is open for business, even in Gawadar. There's still room and place in the port for European companies and countries to invest. <clears throat> of course, you see, um, a CPEC just gives an opportunity to connectivity to China. But it's not exclusive. I mean, Chinese also would want this to become an investment hub for, for companies from all over the, uh, the world, especially in Europe. Mm. Talking about climate change, Europe, there's a lot of um, political debate about it, but um, it's one of Pakistan's main challenges as well, and Pakistan is doing a lot. Why is Pakistan doing a lot? Because in contributing to the problem, you're not a big player, so you're doing a lot for solutions. Uh, well, first of all, I, I'm a, I was always an environmentalist because you know, I loved hunting, I loved shooting. And as I grew up, I saw that in Pakistan, two things were happening. Our forests were disappearing and our wildlife was disappearing. So from becoming a hunter, I became a conservationist. And so I've always, uh, uh, I love Pakistan's wilderness. I think Pakistan has some of the most diverse uh, wilderness in the world. It has, it has 12 climatic zones from Alpine, it right, goes right down to the coast and the desert. Um, and so um, being an outdoor person, and I love trekking in our mountains. Our mountains are probably, there's nowhere, I've been everywhere. Nowhere in the world you have the sort of trekking we have in our mountains in the, in the four ranges, Himalayas, Karakoram, Suleiman Range, uh, Hindu Kush. So, uh, as I grew up, I realized that, you know, the, the beauty of this country was disappearing because our wilderness was uh, disappearing and our forest cover was disappearing. So when my party came to power in, uh, in uh, 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 the, the Khabar Pakhtunkhwa province of uh, uh, one of the four provinces, so we decided to plant one billion trees uh, in four years and we, we did it. And now we've set our self target since I became the Prime Minister of 10 billion trees in Pakistan. And uh, it's, it's really to improve our environment, improve our forest cover, bring back wildlife. But Pakistan is also likely to be affected by climate change more than other countries because our, our, this country depends on our rivers. And our rivers, 80% of the water in our rivers 
comes from the glaciers and the mountains. And because of global warming, these glaciers are melting at a fast rate, and, and that is a big worry for us. We have the impression in, in Europe that Pakistan is opening up to the world, getting out of isolation, um, and tourism could be a driver to get um, more people from all over the world to, to Pakistan. Are there special measurements taken to even accelerate tourism? Yes, we've opened up uh, Pakistan. 70 countries can get visa at the airport. Uh, we have opened up all our areas. Uh, and now that it's been one of the safest years, 2019, our tourism doubled in one year. So, uh, so uh, Pakistan offers probably the most unique tourism in the world because it has it's because of its diversity. Firstly, it's an ancient land. The Indus Valley civilization is 5,000 years old. Secondly, it is home to four uh, world religions: uh, Sufism. It has some of the ancient sites for Sufism. Then Hinduism, it has ancient sites for the Hindu uh, religion. Then Sikhism, it has two of the most revered sites in Pakistan um, for the Sikh religion. And then, of course, Buddhism. The north of Islamabad was the center of the Gandhara civilization. And that is, uh, you know, one of the most, for the, for the Buddhists, this is one of the best places for visiting their ancient sites. And on top of it, we have our mountains in the north. And we probably have the most unique mountain uh, 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 tourism in the world. Firstly, it's undiscovered. Not many people know about it. Half the world peaks over 24,000 feet are in, in Pakistan, including the second highest mountain. So it has diverse tourism. And the cities, three cities, are over 1,000 years old. So in that sense, Pakistan is undiscovered. It's, it's uh, uh, not actually, some countries are destroyed by tourism. Pakistan is not. A lot of hospitality here and with peace now and s security in this country, we expect that we will, uh, the level of tourism will grow quantumly in Pakistan. Uh, finally, may I ask you some two perhaps more personal questions which uh, <coughs> trigger me. Um, why did you, as a famous sports star, came back to Pakistan? Was it a kind of duty, inevitable? Um, because you could say, I stay in London or the Bahamas, and you know, into politics is already difficult, coming to Pakistan as well with expectations. So what was the driver to get you into politics? Uh, first of all, you know, I never really lived away from Pakistan. I only went for studying uh, in England for four years. And then I used to play professional cricket in England. So that meant summer in England. But winter was always in Pakistan. So I never really went away. Never at any point did I ever want to live away from Pakistan. I never wanted to take a British passport, although I was spending you know, almost 17, 18 summers playing professional cricket there. But you see, the, I, I could never imagine a purposeless existence. My life was always driven from the age of nine. From the age of nine, I wanted to be to represent Pakistan in cricket. And so from that age onwards did I left cricket. I was driven by you know, taking Pakistan to the top of world cricket. And when I, my last match was Pakistan winning the World Cup. Then I went, uh, spent the next uh, 10 years building a cancer hospital. My mother died of cancer. cancer. And so poor people had nowhere to go if, if they get cancer. So it took me uh, almost eight years to build the cancer, nine years to build the cancer hospital. And then I decided to go into politics because I felt that the political elite in Pakistan was corrupt. And corruption is the biggest reason why countries have poverty. It's not lack of resources. Countries are not poor because of lack of resources, because some of the richest countries in terms of resources are poor because of corruption. So I came in on an anti-corruption platform some 23 years ago. And because I was uh, fighting the political mafias, that's why it took me so long to succeed. And then it's, it's related to, to the, the previous question, the image 
which I read also from, from British tabloids, was more like a very liberal, young, successful cricket star becoming a more religious person. How hard was that, or was it just also another aspect that people in the West didn't see? Look, if a human being is lucky, if they're lucky, sometimes during their life they will ask them, themselves two questions. One, what is the purpose of my existence? And two, what happens to me after I die? And if they are luckier, they will find the answers in spirituality. Because science does not answer these two questions. So, like everyone else, uh, all the time I, I would uh, self-analyze, analyze my life. I had more fame than anyone in my country. I had love in this country and an easier life, a privileged life. So I could have spent the rest of my life actually just talking about cricket and living very well. But if you, if, if you uh, do ask yourself the question, what is my purpose of existence? And the spiritual, in, the, uh, in the spiritual world, it is not that uh, I should live as a selfish uh, life, which is what, if I wanted, I could have lived a very comfortable, selfish existence. In the spiritual world, you are responsible. The more the Almighty gives you, the more responsibility you have towards other human beings. Hence, my life turned from first uh, to build a hospital for poor people, and then uh, to enter politics and, and build a welfare state. No matter how much social work I would have done, I could never have helped so many people as you can in government and build a welfare state. So it is all part of that spiritual journey which comes from asking these two questions. And finally, um, given the challenges of, of Pakistan, given the history, given what they call the establishment, which there are the other parties, um, are you never afraid to take up the challenge? Because this is a country where the life of a prime minister means a lot. Well, first, <laughs> you must understand that when you, when you move towards spirituality, so one thing that happens, uh, and my uh, faith uh, tells me, that life and death is in Almighty's hands. And all you have in your hands is effort. We human beings, all we have is the ability to struggle. Whether we succeed or not is not in our hands, it's in Almighty's hands. So I do not fear death, I don't fear failure. All I know is that I will try my best, and once I've tried my best, I leave it to the Almighty. So whatever is his decision, I'll accept it as the will of God. Mr. Prime Minister, I had so many questions, I still have about Pakistan, but thank you very much.